Hi, my name is Ian Duncan, and welcome to a new video series for the Music with Lisp channel, the Scheme for Max Vlog, in which I demonstrate things that are works in progress, a little less polished, not necessarily ready for publication. Um, it was requested by one of the people interested in Scheme for Max, suggested this would be helpful. And so uh, we're going to take a look at something that's on the workbench right now. And we're going to take a look today at experimenting with microtonality with Scheme for Max and uh, why you might want to do that. So uh, to begin with, there's a few reasons Scheme is appropriate for doing this, and I'll show a couple of them on the screen. Um, the, the first one that I think is interesting is that Lisps believe in fractions. So we're specifically looking at just intonation style microtonality today. And unlike a lot of languages, um, we're not forced down to a float. So if we ask to divide uh, 3 by 2, for example, instead of getting 1.5, we're going to get the fraction 3 over 2 until we tell it otherwise. And this means we can also create a list of fractions. So for example, on the screen over there, I've got um, how you would arrive at a just intonation uh, major ninth. 3 over 2 times 3 over 2, so that is a, uh, well actually a major second is what I mean. We've got 3 over 2, 3 over 2, so that's a fifth on top of a fifth, which gives us a ninth, and then to drop it by an octave, we multiply it by uh, 1 over 2 for octave equivalence. And so we can represent that in scheme in a way that makes sense for how we're thinking about it in a, in a list of fractions, and conveniently all we have to do to change this to a function call is change that list operator to multiplication. So in that sense, if we're working with just intonation, it's a lot easier to keep track of how we got somewhere, or how we're deriving a pitch. So that's the first reason. Uh, the second reason is, you know, practical. I, I found when I was experimenting with microtonality earlier that the hardest part of doing that is really, you know, how, how do you set up your tuning systems quickly um, so that you can try things out. It's it's quite cumbersome with regular VST instruments or even regular synthesizers. You've got to figure out a tuning, uh, put it all in, then start playing with it. Maybe it's not what you wanted. Um, so I wanted to come up with a tool in Max that allows one to experiment very quickly with just intonation tunings, and that's what I'm going to demonstrate today. And uh, Scheme for Max is great for creating this because... It does involve quite a bit of uh, MIDI information parsing and also a fair bit of representing things in formulas, both of which are elegantly done in Scheme for Max compared to doing it in a raw Max patcher. So we'll take a look at how I did that. What I've got on the top left of the window is a view that I've made in a Max patcher um, using the jitter cell block object. And we've got an 8x8 eight eight grid at the bottom. And that is a representation of this Novation Launchpad. And then we also have a header at the top showing how we get to a pitch. And that's controlled by this mini launchpad. So what I've enabled is setting up a tuning system to experiment with quite quickly. And the way I'm doing that is... Each pitch gets represented as a list of eight numbers, and they are uh, numerator, denominator, numerator, denominator, numerator, denominator, numerator, denominator. So that's up here. And so if I wanted to put in, let's say, for example, a perfect fifth, I would enter three. These are mapped one to eight, so three. And you can see our header has updated. Right now, there's just the number three. And then I'm going to put in a denominator two. And so the top now shows that we have three over two. That comes out to 1.5. Here's its value in cents. And here's its value in uh, linear octaves. OK. Now, if I wanted to make that the major, the major second that we were talking about again, I'd simply add another three and another two. Now we can see. We've got 3 over 2, 3 over 2, coming out to 9 over 4, or 2.25. We want to drop that an octave, so we're going to add the next fraction will be 1 over 2. 
and now we get 9 over 8. Okay, the next thing, I, I can preview that now. Okay, there we go. That's it on the synthesizer. Of course, I haven't played the root, so it's not, not very meaningful yet. Um, but I'm going to put this in save mode. Save mode, pick up my other pad, and I'll store that here. We'll make a, a little just intonation scale so you can see what's going on. Okay, and now you can see it has shown up on the grid here. And if I take it out of saving mode, I can now play pitches with this pad. There's the root, and there's the just tuned um, major second. So by doing this, I can punch a whole slew of pitches into this grid really pretty quickly and easily see how I got to them with my sets of numerators and denominators and see, you know, roughly where they are in cents if I'm interested in how they compare to an equal tempered interval and uh, try them out in different harmo harmonic configurations. So for example, I'm going to put the uh, camera down to show the pads and we'll use this to create a just tuned uh, major scale. And for those of you who are not familiar with how just intonation works, um, we'll, I'll talk about how we get those pitches. And you'll see that they come out in a harmonic grid that actually makes them more representative of how we got to them. So I'm gonna lower the camera and put in some pitches. Okay, so you can see the pads, and let's uh, let's get started. I'm going to put in first of all my my first triad here. So I'm going to just zero this board. I'll reset it. Okay, so we've zeroed the board, and I'm going to uh, well we'll start. We'll put our triads over here in the top three rows um, with the uh, let's put them at the bottom note first. So our first note, our octave. We're leaving that alone. Then the next thing we want is uh, a just tuned major third. So that's going to be five over four. Fix this cable. I'll put this in edit mode and I'm gonna store that here. Okay, then we need a perfect fifth. So that's three over two. I'm gonna store that here. The next thing you need to make just intonation in major is the uh, the same business made on a chord a fifth up and a fifth down. Of course, a fifth down is a fourth up. So we're going to make the next root of our chord four over three. So four over three, we'll store it here. Now we need a third over the fourth and a fifth over the fourth. That's how we get a four chord in just intonation. So the third over the fourth, we're gonna put five over four, and we'll apply that to four over three and save it. Finally, we need the fifth of the fourth. Of course, that's the root, but we want it up an octave. We'll, we'll punch it in that way anyway. So that's going to be three over two times four over three times one over two, and we put it in there. Oh, I have screwed up. Uh, we don't want one over two. There we go. Okay, now we need to do this for the fifth. So I'll zero this board. Our root will be three over two. We'll store that there. Then our seventh comes from a major third on top of the fifth. So five over four, three over two. There's our major seventh. And finally, we have three over two times three over two. And we put it there. We put this in record mode, or take it out of edit mode rather. We can now play our triads. And so that gives us adjust intonation major tonality. But you can see that it'd be trivial for us to put in other systems. So uh, let's let's try that right now. We'll zero the board and we'll put in something that, that isn't in our major toning, tuning system. And then I'll show you briefly uh, how, how it works. Okay, we're gonna reset the board. So let's, let's try something with numerators and denominators of seven. 
which is higher than we deal with in our standard major minor tonality system. So we'll keep our root, and then we'll put something in that is uh, 7 over 6 above that. Okay, That is not in our major minor tuning system. And then uh, for the next one, let's put, um, let's put say, uh, just the, the fifth again. So we've made a, a different kind of, oops, that's not the fifth. We've made a different kind of chord. Instead of one uh, plus a major third plus a fifth, we have one plus this seven over six interval. And let's put it in uh, play mode. Oh, I made a mistake. That happens a lot. I need to reset my root. So reset the board, put it in save. Okay, there we go. And it's represented as a column. And now we can do this again over another interval. So let's um, make the same stack again over a fifth and over a fourth. And we'll get something that is not the same as our regular minor, major minor tonality, but it will have a lot of common notes and we've derived it from a very similar formula. So it's not, it's not particularly distant, but uh, it's easy for me to remember while doing this and you'll, you'll get the sense. So four over three is gonna be our fourth. Okay, we'll put that here. And then on top of four over three, we're going to put seven over six. And we'll put that there. And then on top of four over three, we're going to put three over two. And we'll put that here. Now we'll do the same thing. We're going to, uh, let's zero our board. We'll do it for the fifth. So three over two, we'll put it there. Then we're gonna put seven over six on top of three over two. We'll put it there. And then we're gonna put three over two on top of three over two, and we'll put it there. And we get out of edit mode. And we have a different tuning set. Now this you know, doesn't sound particularly different because seven over six is really not that far from six over five, which is a minor third or five over four, but it is different. And you could use the same principle with bigger pads of buttons to explore larger sets of numbers. Or instead of going one to eight across the top, you could limit it to just primes. So you get into much higher numerator and denominator combinations uh, much sooner. So uh, let's take a look briefly at it, how we did this in code. I'm not going to get into a ton of detail, but I'll give you a sense of what's involved. And if it's stuff that you're interested in, uh, please let me know in the comments and I can publish at least simplified versions. So I should mention first that um, right now this project is part of a larger sequencing project. And in a subsequent video, I'll demonstrate using these pads to put these pitches into a step sequencer on the fly. Uh, that's not quite ready to demo, but uh, there's a whole bunch of code on the screen that comes from, comes from that. Okay. Whoops. That was not what I meant to do. Okay, that's what I meant to do. So the output is actually handled just through VST instruments. So here in this patch, I've got some VST instruments. And what I'm doing is uh, sending a pitch bend signal just before the actual pitch for each one. And so um, I can show you the code for that quickly in this output function here. Um, this gives you an idea of why I feel like it's elegant to do in, in Scheme. So in order to get a ratio into a combination of a MIDI note and pitch band, we need to figure out what it is in sense. And so we do that right here. We take our ratio, uh, apply log two, and then multiply by 1200, we get the pitch in sense. Um, then it's pretty easy for us to get the number of semitones to get that interval and uh, the pitch bend amount we need, which is the leftover sense after the number of semitones. And we get the MIDI bend units from that by um, assuming that our synthesizer, which you should check, is doing 200 cents in either direction for your pitch bend controller. And we make a list of <coughs> the semitones and the MIDI pitch bend units you need to get that 
no doubt. So that's uh, pretty tight. You know, if you had to do that in Max or even C or JavaScript, I, I would argue it would not be nearly so elegant to represent. Then to output it, I take the ratio that we've played, which is the sets of numerators and denominators, and you can see it's pretty easy. You multiply all the numerators, multiply all the denominators, divide them. That gives us our ratio that we want to output. Call the function we just did to get the MIDI semitones and pitch bend units. Then uh, some standard values that we've just nailed down as static right now, but in the sequencing environment, they're dynamic. So that's, you know, velocity and duration. And we make a list out of that and uh, we send it out the output for Scheme for Max. And that becomes, let's make this patch a little larger. That becomes this list coming out here, it gets unpacked to be uh, a make note plus a MIDI pitch bend value. And we go into the MIDI format object with high res two so that we are using 14-bit uh, um, pitch bend values. And then it goes into VST instrument. We're, we're using uh, UHE Zebra right now. So that's the output. Um, the input also is quite straightforward in Scheme. Uh, I've got a patch here. I'll jack it up a bit. Shows all my MIDI devices that I'm using in this system. And all I do is prepend the function name for what I want to do with those values. So key step CC is a scheme function. Key step note is a scheme function. In this case, we're just using the two pads. So this will map to uh, pad CC2 device to the arguments from the MIDI value. And over in my input devices, this is what those parsing functions look like. So I have uh, notes coming from the pad. They get uh, divvied up. This essentially is a map um, that reverses from the default novation pitch uh, note to button map. And then it dispatches from there to some other functions inside my controller. So my controller, I'll pop up, oh, pop up to the controller. So I have a state object that's keeping track of various things. This again is something that's a lot easier to do in code than in Max. You know, creating objects with a lot of state in Max gets pretty cumbersome. In Scheme, it's really easy. We're using an internal state hash table. Uh, we have our base note, which is a C for now. Our pitch fractions, that represents this row on the top. That's a vector of eight numbers. Our saved pitches is a multi-dimensional vector representing this grid. Um, oh, my head is blocking the grid. I'll move the camera. I'll just turn it off. So the uh, saved pitches is representing the grid here. And then we have state variables for pitch sub mode. That's saying, you know, I'm, I was hitting those top buttons to say, am I in record mode or am I in edit mode or am I in, in preview mode? And then we have some functions down here, my pitch mode functions. And you can see they're all quite manageable amounts of code. Um, this one is mapped to the button that changes what mode we're in. Just showing on the console right now whether I'm saving or playing. This is the function that saves a pitch into the grid and the code is really quite small. It copies the pitch fraction list from the controller. So that gets the pitch fractions from the controller, makes a copy, plonks it into the saved pitch vector, and then uh, calls the function that actually sets that GUI element. And uh, if we're in preview mode, um, we have the play pitch function. And the play pitch function does really much the same thing, looks up those parts and calls play pitch, which will handle all that conversion and output. And then there's the, uh, the GUI interaction. So the, the GUI interaction is quite simple, actually. These are jitter cell blocks and we just need to send it messages to update it. I'll show you this out of presentation mode for a moment. So it's just some cell blocks. I'm sending messages on load for all the default values I want there. It's 
and I have uh, send messages sprinkled throughout the code for updating this. So for example, when I play a pitch, I've got that blue highlight showing up so that we can remember what pitch that was that we were playing or where we are in the grid. And that just happens from sending the pitch view grid object this max message. So this code is no different than a message in max saying cell call roll and then all these values. And so uh, some total of that is that it's quite easy for us to experiment with different tuning systems, punch them in and get them playing right away. And uh, these can be as arbitrarily <laughs> complex as you want. But the nice thing about the grid, I think, or a few nice things about the grid is that it, it still represents the vertical harmonic way we got at the stack, as well as the, um, let me move my camera, oh, flailing, flailing. Not a pro at this yet. It still represents the harmonic vertical stack that we use to get those values as well as um, the linear stack. So we could easily organize those out in a line. Um, we can keep them in our chord relationships, whatever we want. So I hope that was interesting to people watching. And if there are parts of this that you would like to play with or are particularly excited about, uh, let me know in the comments. Um, and I'll, I'll get what people are most interested in out first and I'll continue putting up uh, quick and dirty videos like this of the uh, Scheme for Max vlog, things that are on the workbench, and uh, I can become the uh, YouTube influencer for lowest possible value of influence, combining esoteric computer language with microtonality. Dozens of viewers, no doubt. So yes, Talk to me in the comments. Let me know if you're interested in seeing more. Um, I hope you enjoy this preview of my microtonal experimentation tools. And there'll be a follow-up with putting these directly into a step sequencer so we can play melodies right away. Thanks very much.